Special Envoy Kerry, the cyclone we're seeing in India is really hitting home the message that more of those storms in the future are a global threat. At the same time, the US is proud of having gathered 55% of global GDP at that virtual summit. Yet Germany insists on exceptions. It doesn't want to leave coal till 2038. The US is continuing fracking. So how do you want to convince poorer countries to do their part in the climate effort? Well, it's uh, critical that the 20 biggest emitters in the world, of which we are one, and the EU counts as a whole as one, and India and China and others, we have to step up. All of us have to lead here by example. And that means we need to be achieving uh, significant reduction goals, not just by 2050, but over the next 10 years. If we 20 nations that are the largest economies of the world don't mitigate, meaning reduce our emissions during 2020 to 2030, then we would be responsible for denying the rest of the world the ability to hold the temperature well below 2 degrees or at 1.5. So that's our imperative. That's what we're trying to now uh, hopefully um, uh, achieve through climate diplomacy over the course of the next months before we go to Glasgow. So in Glasgow, the less developed world will be able to know that we've got the $100 billion we've pulled together that has been promised, and that we are doing our part to keep 1.5 degrees alive. Now, reducing emissions is the one thing. At the same time, the Earth's lung is under threat. Brazilian President Bolsonaro was also around that table, pledging that he would reduce illegal logging, stop it till 2030. At the same time, the Amazon rainforest is seeing a 10-year high in its decrease. How is the United States going to apply pressure that those pledges are also met? Well, we're working with President Bolsonaro and with uh, his team. Uh, we've had several conversations. Uh, we were certainly encouraged that he talked about stopping the deforestation, but we believe, obviously, as do many scientists and others in the world who are experts on the Amazon, that we can't wait till 2030. We have to move much sooner than that. But um, we have to work with the country, uh, the sovereign nation that has control over its own land, and reach some kind of an agreement if we possibly can. Obviously. Uh, there will be a need to have some kind of enforcement that's credible and that we have a different approach to this than we've had previously. Uh, there's no guarantee we can get there, but we're certainly going to try together with other nations that are deeply concerned about this. Now, you've just met all major political actors ahead of those September elections, the end of the Merkel era here in Germany. How would you feel about a government going green, looking at the polling? The Greens could actually have the first time the chance to form a government here. How would you feel about a green government at the helm of Europe's largest economy going into that crucial climate summit in November? In well, it's up to the people of Germany to decide, you know, it's not up to me and how I feel or President Biden feels about it. Uh, we certainly support uh, the policy of addressing climate crisis. And obviously the Greens are, are, are very seized by uh, and, and engaged in that particular issue. But um, this is for the campaign ahead, not for us. And unlike Russia, we're not going to involve ourselves in other people's elections. But you also discussed with the Pope that he should probably participate in that climate summit. Is that a sign that you politicians will no longer be able to solve it alone? No, it's a sign that a head of state, remember, he's also a head of state. Not a very uh, big one, though. But not yeah. a very big one, but <laughs> it speaks volumes that uh, even as a small one, but as a very, very powerful moral leader in the world and the leader of... Uh, more than just the 1.1 billion Catholics, but a, but a very powerful voice who wrote a remarkable document in Laudato Si. Uh, I think uh, he can help invigorate uh, the uh, folks who are gathered there and have a message for the world about the importance of what is happening there. But there'll be many leaders there who will also join uh, in that effort. This is the world's most important moment with respect to multilateralism and a global effort to solve a major international challenge. 
And if we don't get it right in Glasgow, then we will be leaving uh, 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 certain parts of the world in chaos and disorder and, and great pain over years, over the ensuing years. The, the less developed world has not caused this problem. And they are uh, patiently waiting for the developed world to step up and exercise their responsibility. And young people are asking adults to behave like adults and get the job done. So that's what's at stake. And I think having, I, I'm delighted to hear that uh, His Holiness wants to come and wants to do this. And I think his voice will be very important. Now you yourself have cited nine years left to go to avoid no longer being able to meet the 1.5 degree uh, aim. At the same time, you want to rely on largely uninvented technology. Ask, are you simply being optimistic? Well, let me answer two parts of that. First of all, it's a mistake just to kind of have a finite number of nine years, et cetera. Scientists gave us a broad range, saying about 12 years left to make uh, the most important decisions to avoid the worst consequences of climate. Uh, but nobody can be that precise with respect to the environment, about one year or two years. The idea is we have a very short period of time, uh, and we have to we have to make those decisions. Now, what I said about invention uh, with respect to it, uh, the IEA, the International Energy Agency, has said that 42 of 46 critical technologies are not yet capable of being brought to scale and put into the marketplace. That's what I was saying. It's not that we haven't invented some of these things. It is that they're not at a scale where they are commercially viable yet. And what we need to do is get green hydrogen or uh, battery storage or storage of some kind and other things able to be able to be brought to the marketplace at scale. That's when it becomes a really viable uh, opportunity. But certainly with solar and with wind and hydro and geothermal, we have a set of options that get us very, very close in many, many places where those are available. And we can do, a lot of nations are already coming extremely close, just with renewable, to being able to provide energy security. Now, I'm confident we can do this if we put our mind to it. And, and, and very large sums of money are now beginning to move from the private sector into investment in the sustainable alternative renewable development uh, field. So I think, uh, you know, I'm confident and optimistic about our ability to get this done, providing we pay close attention, not just to 30 years from now with a big target, but with a very specific set of plans for how we will reduce sufficiently over the next 10 years, 2020 to 2030 is the key decade of decision. And that's what will decide uh, a significant part of uh, all of our future, of the planet's future. Just one final question. When such close allies get together, you, surely you have to talk about the situation in the Middle East right now. How much longer will the United States block a resolution calling for well, an end to the fighting in the United uh, Nations? Look, I'm, I'm not ducking your question, but it's not my bailiwick right now. I'm, I'm the climate uh, envoy, and uh, President Biden and Secretary Blinken are speaking to this issue, and I leave it to them to do so. Special Envoy for Climate, John Kerry, thank you very much for talking to you, Dr. Thank Leonard. you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you.